Thank you, Madam Chairman, Your Excellencies, very distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I am very proud and honored to have the privilege today of addressing this distinguished gathering of people who are gathered together in order to celebrate the breaking of the Berlin Wall, in order to examine the many problems and contentions which still exist after this breaking up. Being, having been given the privilege of addressing you, I had to decide on a topic, because there are so many angles concerning the world problem today. I thought that perhaps I should speak as to why I believe that the politics of might is right, which prevails, is not conducive to lasting peace. A few months ago, I was invited to China to take part in a debate on the future of China. Former U.S. President Bill Clinton was representing the Americas. Tony Blair was representing UK and Europe. Kevin Rood of Australia was representing Australia and Oceania. Former President Lee of Korea was representing Asia. And myself was invited to represent Africa and the Indian Ocean area. And there we are debating about China and the impact of China in the future of the world. Make no mistake, with one people in four people being Chinese in the world, the China factor cannot be underestimated. Now, it so happened that from Guangzhou, where this conference was being held, I went over to Beijing, where, within context of my agenda, I saw that I had been invited to pay a visit to the National Shipping Cooperation of China. And I got there, it didn't take me long to realize that the Shipping Cooperation of China was divided into two, two main branches, maritime, freight, cargo, civil shipping on the one side, and then the military, naval shipping on the other side. But China has already taken over as a world leading shipping cooperation. That didn't bother me too much until I saw the military side, where I was shown, for example, a sort of frigate which we had a building for Pakistan. And I saw the submarines which you were building. And that the advancement they've made in terms of offshore oil etc. Now, this is where I came to reflect a bit about the politics of might is right. Just a few months before, I had been to Singapore, and one evening I looked at the television, and there was this documentary about nations building up weapons of mass destruction. Now, so long as there's a competition in the world for nations, each one to build, when we already have reached a level where we can destroy the human planet, we are seeing more and more sophisticated weapons being put on the theater of planet Earth. When we realize that already so much money is being spent on defense budget, causing so much problems in the world. And I started to think, if this competition in this area prevails, then 
One day, the United States would not appreciate if China puts forward a larger aircraft carrier and then decide we've got to build a, a bigger one. And when you think that the human race today is spending three times more on defense budget rather than on human resource development, we do realize there's a big problem. The importance of the armament industry is such, it could be silent, but it is there, the influence they are playing, not only in dictatorship nation, but also among some so-called democracy. Once upon a time, Great Britain had the empire, the mightiest empire, and Britannia ruled the waves. So one could understand Britain at that time building up a galaxy of warship to control their dominion around the world. But who would have thought that this year, for example, the United Kingdom launched HMS Elizabeth, one of the largest aircraft carrier ever built, costing 3.8 billion pounds sterling. <coughs> this sort of uh, attitude that might is right, which was in fact exhibited vis-a-vis -vis the I Iraq conflict. <coughs> In order for the intervention to be legally justified and right, the United States had to obtain the sanction of the United Nations. We saw a United Nations which had been marginalized before because the US were refusing to pay its contribution because some Congress people were not happy with certain decisions taken by the General Assembly. <coughs> so we saw an initiative of diplomacy where Colin Powell was sent across Africa to try and get the support of African nations for intervention in Iraq. And the Ville of France was not so much for intervention, also went there. We saw when the vote was taken, the United Nations refused to sanction physical intervention in Iraq. And nonetheless, let's remember, we saw the United States putting together the biggest naval armada we had seen. And there, all of us started to realize the power, physical, naval, air force, which the United States represented. <coughs> In no time, what did we see? The crushing down of uh, Iraq under Saddam Hussein, with President Bush rushing to proclaim victory. Was this victory? Well, history has the answer and each one of us may have our different opinion. Now, President Kennedy came here and said, I'm a Berliner. During the time of the Cold War, and then we saw the great event, the breakdown of the walls. But did President Kennedy ever realize that today, in this day and age, around each American embassy in big cities has been created now a wall. In the past, embassies doors were open. People who had problems could rush into the embassy and seek political asylum. But if you try to seek political asylum in an American embassy today, you'll find you might be shot long before you get to the reception. Now, these are visible signs of a malaise. And sometimes 
leaders, they see this, but they don't have the courage to speak about it. Because the United States, in many respects, is all powerful. Now I can speak my mind because I'm not seeking for power tomorrow. If I was a candidate for the presidential election again, I would have to be mindful of how would the CIA react? How would M15 react? Or the intelligence react? There is a need, my friends, for us to address this problem. This problem of the race to become the more superior military nation or powerful nation. The amount of money which is being wasted in these areas of conflict, which has already caused so many lives. We have got more urgent issues. And I believe there's no doubt that a change of heart must take place. We must start to speak not only with our mind, but with our heart. Like the lady from South Africa yesterday said, there is no solution just through the barrel of the gun. The gun may bring temporary victory, if you want to call it so, but to use the words of uh, De Gaulle, when he spoke about France, la France a perdu une bataille, la France n'a pas perdu la guerre, saying that France lost a battle, but France has lost the war. Now we must aim to win the war, the war of peace. That must be our priority. And for this, there must be a lack, total lack of selfishness. And I think perhaps one of the great lessons which Germany has shown by its reunification will, to all intents and purposes, has been successful, is the fact that one country with one ideology and one country with a lot of wealth has been ready to merge with under the side different ideology and to create one united Germany. I'm sure it has not been easy, but it has been a challenge which everyone must give our head a racking to try and see how we get along now to more unity in diversity. Now, Europe today poses a great problem in terms of all what I understand comes the question of the right to free travel which, in my view, is sacrosanct to the raison d'etre of Europe as a united continent. And there is where I believe one also has got to take into account the factor of China. Now, in every province of China, there are as many people as you put in three or four Bulgaria together. You are dealing now with a market situation of so many billion people. And we cannot afford, therefore, in my view, if we believe that there's a need for a steady world, to see a Europe which is disintegrated, a Europe which is not united face to face with the emergence of China, India, Brazil, and the United States. So I think uh, the onus, the burden, the challenges lies on several of you, distinguished leaders, to be able now to uh, go on the road of compromise, if compromise is necessary, but above all of existing in peace and unity in order to face the challenges ahead. Thank you.